Hello from Chicago. My name is Richard Miller, and you're at Never Not Here. And uh, one of the latest talks that I uh, that we have up actually with uh, Stephen Silla, and we were talking about journalism that matters, and we were talking about uh, one to one, one uh, one to many as far as news. Uh, it doesn't really work anymore, and we started talking about dialogues, uh, like uh, more than one, just having a discussion. And so then that's what we're into also. Uh, we just want to get everyone's points of view, and we want to uh, uh, actually be inspired by a different kind of a, somehow, as we speak in groups, and if we... You know, if we really accept accept uh, the whole group dynamic, somehow, at least to me, that seems like it brings on a uh, possibility to have a lot of insight from other people. And uh, so that's what we're doing ag again today. And uh, so let's just get started. And uh, from Seattle, we have Matt Kahn. Welcome, Matt. Well, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah. And then uh, from England, we have uh, Rupert Spira. So, hi, Rupert. Hi. Hello. Hi. Somehow I find myself talking to a lot of people in a certain, should I call it a sector, or um, sharing a certain experiential base, or... And I mean, I could ask, like, how did I get here? What am I doing here? And uh, so a lot of us find that, that we're giving a, lot, a certain amount of energy to look uh, deeply into life or deeper than we had before or deeper than it seems that uh, is conventional wisdom. And uh, somehow here we are. Uh, and actually some of our, some of the coaching that comes to us is that you really have to want the, uh, uh, a new life or a renewed life. You really have to w desire and, and we even go as far as saying to know the truth, you know, <laughs> so, and, uh, there's some momentum to it. Here I am. I don't know. I'm knocking out one talk a day. I mean, <laughs> I guess it'll, everything that goes up goes down, right? It'll fizzle sooner or later. But um, what is this drive? What is this urge? Maybe start asking Rupert, what, do, what are we actually doing here? Uh, why do we, uh, what, is there some neediness or something? Or what's missing? It's simply the desire for happiness. that all seven billion of us are engaged in. Everyone wants happiness or, or love or peace, which are, are, are all synonymous. And happiness is just another name for the, the simple knowing of our own being. The knowing of our own being as it truly is. When we seem to know something other than our own being, when we think that we are something other than unlimited, ever-present awareness, then the happiness that is innate in us is apparently veiled. Not really veiled, but apparently veiled. So as soon as our true nature is seemingly forgotten, the experience of happiness is forgotten. And, and it is for this reason that the separate self that we subsequently imagine ourselves to be is by definition on a search for happiness. And, and this is the activity that all seven billion people are engaged in. Is happiness subjective? I mean, it, it certainly is in, uh, in, uh, when we're trying to reach what out. What do you mean by subjective, Richard? Is it different for different people? No. It's the same. Like, like love. We all, we all know that when we refer to love or happiness, we all know what we're referring to, and we're referring to, this, to the same thing. 
So the search for enlightenment is just an exotic form of the same search. It, it's really an extension of the same search. M most people search for happiness in, in the realm of objects. To begin with, in the conventional search out in the world for objects, situations, substances, activities, relationships, because all these are believed to be the way to find happiness. Sorry. But sooner or later, this search in the world through objects fails us. So we, we refine our search and we start a spiritual search for happiness. And in this spiritual search, we tend to seek for states of the mind instead of objects. But it's essentially the same search. It's, it's the search for a state rather than an object. And sooner or later, this search also fails us. And then there's only one place left to look. And that is to, to question the one that is in search. The one that is unhappy and that is moving out towards objects or, or states in an attempt to recover this happiness. And of course, when we when we look for this one, this separate self who is in search, we never find it. We, if, if we look, if we look simply and clearly and honestly enough, we find that the true self, the only self there is, the presence of awareness. And, and if we stay with this presence and allow it to reveal its qualities to us, which means to itself, we discover that it's not located, that it's not limited, and that it is itself the very peace and happiness for which we were in search. Sometimes when I think of happiness, uh, yeah, it does sound subjective to me. And then, so I think, well, what's underneath happiness? And I just think uh, a state of rest. In other words, I don't rest very often. And, and it might just be a curiosity to know, well, I mean, what would it be? <laughs> Maybe Matt will give a few comments on it. What would it be if you were just at rest? Well, I think that when you're just to address what Rupert was saying so eloquently, is that happiness, true happiness comes about through the willingness to be sincere. There are so many that are in pursuit of happiness, whether through, as Rupert was saying, a world of objects, through trying to acquire more of something or to push less of something in a way to get more of something else, to constantly be in that addition and subtraction kind of a labyrinth of life. And even on a spiritual path, we're trying to equate everything to the comparisons of less and more. But really, true happiness is the willingness to be sincere. When you find yourself in a place of rest, uh, there is nothing but sincerity. In the same way that the word truth for children is synonymous with the word honesty. And so there's a lot of us on the spiritual path that have been well uh, trained to do this kind of inquiry to look deeper. And of course, looking deeper than the world of objects starts to turn even the internal spiritual quest into another form of conceptual objects and searching. And one way we can look at this is that when we are willing to be completely honest or to rest in a willingness to be completely sincere with ourselves and others in every moment, uh, the inquiry of what this path offers us doesn't have to be done as separate from life, but actually life itself becomes an ongoing natural inquiry where our willingness to be sincere brings us deeper than the surface to actually see what's underneath it all. And of course, in seeing what's underneath it all, all we find is the truth of who we are. So I like to think that true happiness is a celebration of how deeply we're willing to abide in our own heartfelt sincerity. And in that heartfelt sincerity, we're living life at the speed of rest. <laughs> the speed of rest, I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you said ongoing natural inquiry. And uh, yes. I think that is totally intriguing. Like that's maybe the, if, you know, what, if, let it be the purpose of life or something, or just that's just a sure. natural thing without even trying to say purpose or, uh, or anything else, uh, put anything on top of it. But somehow that seems to be blocked by something. Uh, belief in uh, some kind of urgency where... I don't know what is it. Why do we have to separate ourselves? It seems like we have to separate ourselves from the ongoing natural inquiry of life. And uh, well, I, yeah, 
and somehow be in, in a so-called spiritual sangha search uh, somewhere else. We and then and then the point of it is just so so we could get back to life and have an ongoing natural inquiry, right? Yeah. Well, well, well it, isn't it ironic if we look at it from that? If we look at how we have to separate ourselves from the life that we inherently feel separate from in order to discover something that leads us back into the, into the life where there's no separation whatsoever. What I would contribute to this as to why things feel separate is primarily because our experiences of perception, a lot of times we're having direct experiences, but we're having direct experiences of what's called interpretation, where we have been taught to label objects that don't call themselves what we have been trained to call them. And therefore, because nothing refers to itself the way we refer to it, that means that the meaning we've given to the labels are only true in our willingness to refer to things with labels. And whenever we refer to things with labels and really believe in the labels and meaning we project onto things, then what happens is, is that the truth of our inherent nature that is always available to be recognized is obscured in our perception because life is only reflecting back the quality of experience that is framed within the label and the meaning that we've projected outward. And then when we start to kind of go deeper into an inquiry, the way I like to look at inquiry is what is this moment like when we just rest? And the only thing that we're going to do is just feel what happens when we don't call things what things don't call themselves. So instead of having a direct experience of interpretation or labels or meaning, or having just a direct experience, perhaps as direct of an experience of the moment, as the moment is having of itself. And then when we find that I do not exist separate from the moment, then I find that that direct experience of how the moment experiences this moment uh, is actually a taste of how I have always been and is experiencing the truth of life in a way that I can't ever not be. But again, that kind of deep inquiry is can be direct and immediate when we have the interest in suspending labels and meaning and just feeling what happens when we're in a moment, simply not referring to things the way things refer to themselves. I know about, you know, interpret. we all know of uh, an experience of interpretation. That's our daily life. But when you say direct interpretation of, of in, no, direct experience of interpretation, yes. somehow that, uh, that bring some distrust, you know, because I think that we're all so much in the spiritual world, we're saying we oh, no, this is a direct experience, you know, <laughs> and so then it, uh, we have to trust it, you know, and, and I don't know, Rupert, what, what, uh, do we ever run across a, where we're talking about the direct experience of interpretation? It sounds like a caution to me. Isn't all experience direct? Yes. But what, what would an indirect experience be? Well, that would be very verbal. It would be a direct experience of, of, of a verbal experience. You, uh, you, you hear some words, you read some words. You, you, th that hearing and that seeing is direct. It, it, all, all experience is intimate and immediate and, and direct. Even, even if it's a, a conceptual label that thinking is superimposing on the experience. Nevertheless, the experience of thinking is direct. The experience of hearing is direct. The experience of seeing, touching, tasting, sensing is direct. Not, not mediated through anything such as a, a separate self, just direct perception. So somehow in, in, uh, in our spiritual seeking, we've given more honor to a, an experience that that has a lower verbal qua content and we're saying and maybe that's how we define it although you're totally correct that everything is direct <laughs> where else how would it be indirect you know it comes off yes. of a mirror or something like that right it's a mirror of our belief so in a way things are uh, uh, are uh, deflected by our beliefs right or but filtered e e even say. a belief even a belief is appears to us in the form of a thought, and that thought is experienced directly as thinking. And thinking is is a modulation of awareness, no matter how erroneous the thought might be. 
the thought may be an interpretation of experience which is very far from the reality of the experience. But nevertheless, it's still made out of thinking, which is itself made out of awareness. So e even a thought which labels an object and seems to refer to an object in its own right, for instance, when we say a chair or a house or a car or a TV or whatever, we seem to refer to these independently existing objects, which we know in reality don't exist. So the thought that labels these apparent objects is, is an erroneous thought. It's an interpretation. But nevertheless, even that thought itself is just the experience of thinking, which is utterly intimately one with awareness. In fact, even closer than that, we can't say it's one with awareness mm -hmm. because there are not two things there in the first place. We, we could say, and of course this is not completely accurate, but it's more accurate, we could say that thinking was like, as it were, a modulation of awareness made only out of awareness. What could be more direct than that? So even our most erroneous beliefs are themselves only direct experience of awareness, knowing its own being. Sometimes it seems like uh, the human experience, uh, I can relate to a lot of my, uh, my r memories, let's say. Uh, perception is, only fac is facilitated, maybe only, but you know, is, is per I'll just say it this way, perception is facilitated by contrast. And so then if we want to know that uh, thinking is uh, uh, an experience, somehow we have to have a period of no thinking, don't we, to have that contrast? Well, I would say, you know, it, to answer what you just said, I would, I would think that to think that you would have to have a period of no thinking as a break from thinking is certainly going to make opposition out of thinking, which as Rupert was just so eloquently stating, I think is not really the purpose of trying to, you know, be in a no thinking section, but actually just to be curious enough or interested enough or sincere enough to actually inquire into the thinking, the beliefs, the labels, the interpretation to actually see that what, it, what in the beginning of a spiritual journey we say or has been said, oh, this thinking is in the way of this, or this is in the way of my bigger spiritual experience, with enough sincerity of heart, with enough interest and focus attention, and just, uh, and just seeing what everything is, we see that even thinking or the sound of interpretation is actually a celebration of just this absolute reality decorating itself within endless spectrums of absolute possibility and what I think this path holds as an opportunity is to turn something like seeking or suffering into an ongoing celebration where whatever arises or appears is not separate in any way from this ever-present awareness, but simply the way in which this reality is decorating itself. And in that experience of experiencing how the life that you are decorates itself with momentary possibilities comes a sense of all-inclusiveness, comes a celebration of equality, and of course comes the deeper radiance of love, which is, to me, love is just how this ever-present awareness embraces itself. Well, you know, the just to go back a little bit, uh, just to go back a little bit, if, you know, you're saying with a sincerity of inquiry, uh, you can actually inquire into thinking and notice that uh, this is a, an experience and start to notice things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, without the contrast of no thinking, uh, it never gets on the table. That there is a such a thing as no thinking. You know, there's, and, and, and if there's a no, no such a thing as no thinking, there's no such a thing as thinking in a way. I mean, you know you can think thoughts and all that stuff and move around, but you, uh, I think, uh, you know, as I recall from my life and, and looking, out, looking out, you know, maybe a lot of high, a supposition, but anyhow, uh, thinking just seems to be perceiving, and uh, it never comes up. It never crosses your mind that you can inquire into perceiving. I mean, until it does, I guess. But that's just what I'm saying. Do sure. we need contrast? Do we need contrast? It's it's only a thought that labels a thought 
as a thought. It's only thinking that says there is something called thinking in the first place. In other words, thought is only thought from the point of view of thought. But thought doesn't truly have its own point of view. It is an illusory point of view. The only real point of view is the point of view of awareness, which of course is not a point of view. But the only one that truly knows is awareness. And it doesn't know a thought as a thought. It doesn't know a sensation as a sensation. For awareness, which is the only one that truly is, all experience is much more intimate than that. Awareness doesn't separate itself out from experience, stand back, take a look at it, and say, ah, that part of it is called a thought. This part of it is called a sensation. This part of it is called a perception or, or the world. But all those labels and apparent experiences are, are for thought alone. That they're not for the, run, the one that truly knows awareness. For, for awareness, experience is much more intimate. It, it knows things as itself. It knows seeming things as itself, not as things or thoughts. So as soon as we're talking about thoughts and perceptions, and of course it's fine to do so, but we have to realize that we're talking about apparent objects which, when looked into, don't really exist in the way that they are conceived. That, that's fine. Nothing against exploring thoughts and sensations and perceptions. But if we take thoughts and sensations and perceptions as being real in their own right, and with that presumption, begin to explore them. Our exploration is never going to go further than, our, than the presumptions that are contained within them. So that is why if we, if we really want to explore our experience, which means our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations, our perceptions, we have to go to the reality of our experience, which is awareness, and to explore experience from there not from the illusory point of view of a thought or a person or an object. So that takes some kind of a coaching. Right? I mean, because it's just not happening, happening, uh, by itself. Uh, yes, yes, it, it takes some exploring. It, it, it takes uh, s s some time to sit with our experience and to explore what it truly is that, that we are experiencing and what is it that experiences and what is the relationship between what is experienced and what experiences. The fundamental presumption in our culture is that there is a separate inside self in here that experiences and that there is a separate outside object, other or world, that is experienced. And, and the, these two, the inside subject and the outside object, are considered to be the, the fundamental equation of our experience. Uh, but if we explore them, and it doesn't matter which we explore, whether we explore the subject or the object, mystics tend to explore the subject, and artists and scientists tend to explore the object, but it doesn't matter which way we go. If we go deeply into either direction, that they, they arrive at the same experiential understanding, which is that there is no subject or object in experience. Experience is not composed of these two essential ingredients. It is much more intimate than that. And the name in our culture that we give to this intimacy is love. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows that the experience of love 
is the absence of the sense of distance, separation, otherness. And that is what all seven billion people are seeking. This absence of separation called love or happiness or, or peace. So somehow it seems like this uh, fundamental equation, which we, we're saying is like uh, there's an inside being here and it's dealing with outside entities there. Somehow that's a barrier because as long as we believe in that, then we have to make ourselves adequate to all these little things all over the place. It, it's a barrier to the imaginary inside self. As long as the imaginary inside self is believed to be real, then this apparent duality seems to be a barrier. In some way, we have to jump over that barrier before we can even begin the investigation, don't we? No, it's the other way around. We explore the separation to discover that the barrier, that is the barrier between the inside self and the outside world, was never there in the first place. It's not that we have to jump over the barrier and then do the exploring. On the contrary, we explore this apparent barrier because it is this apparent barrier that is propelling all seven billion of us to seek happiness in objects. And sooner or later, when these objects have failed us sufficiently, we begin to question this fundamental presumption, this inside self that seems to be moving around in time and space. Who am I? What is this self on whose behalf I labor 24-7 every day of my life? What is it? So then you said like mystics start looking inside, but uh, art well, artists and uh, inventors and so on look outside. So we're all looking yeah. outside and that's, our, that's how no. our uh, investigation no. starts? It depends. It, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether we start, which side of the equation we start with. We either ask, who is myself? Who, who is this I on whose behalf I'm continually working, acting, relating? Or we, we may think, what is the world? What is an object? What is, what, what is all this that we're seeing really made of? What, what is its reality? It doesn't matter which we start with. In, in fact, many of us do both. We explore the inside self and the outside world. That's, that's the thorough way. It, it really, it's the same exploration. It, it's the exploration of our experience. And if we go deeply into our experience, wherever we start, with the outside world, the inside self, wherever we start, if we explore simply and honestly enough, we, we come inevitably to the same experiential understanding. And that experiential understanding is, is another name for peace or love. So I guess we can make a lot of assumptions about peace and love. If somehow society would look uh, yeah, totally different if more and more people were in touch with this peace and love. And, and even when we're thinking about uh, society and the economy in general, which a lot of people are thinking nowadays because it seems there's a, it's a stressful period, uh, we, we can see that the whole point of a uh, economy and the whole point of a uh, society is somehow to share the planet Earth with the inhabitants and uh, allow everyone an opportunity to find this peace and love and, and, uh, and to benefit by uh, all the goodness and uh, all the advantages of, <laughs> of all our resources. And uh, could that be said also about the spiritual search? In other words, What's the point of it? Uh, the point should be that uh, society and and uh, the populations of the planet Earth would somehow live in a harmony and uh, be able to manifest uh, what is known inside. It, 
And, you know, to respond to that, what I would say is that the spiritual search is dependent upon one's depth of clarity, and that clarity being a manifestation of how deeply one's sincerity really runs. And that there's a spiritual journey when we're trying to cultivate clarity, we're trying to have a certain experience, we hear the things that are spoken about, we want to have the experience of that no separate self, we want to abide in awareness, and these then become goals that really start to take us away from that deep uh, celebration of sincerity where the deepest inquiry and the simplest inquiry can take place. And then of course, aside from the spiritual journey, we have life that for some creates a sense of suffering or despair, and yet the spiritual journey isn't here necessarily to take you or free you from that despair or suffering, but to help translate and teach that it's the despair and suffering that breaks apart all the barriers. So that's kind of like what Rupert, re yeah. Rupert referred to that uh, in, a, in a way. He didn't say it's despair and suffering, but he says when things looking out breaks down. So then are we saying that's kind of like the origin or, or like the motivation of well, or just the fact that we're searching for happiness that's and we're we're defining ourselves as not having it well I, I would simply say that in the aftermath of suffering or despair a deeper sense of sincerity is embraced and in that embracing of sincerity something deeper can be seen in the kind of inquiry so I think if there's anything for a spiritual path you know of course inviting us into a deeper inquiry it's showing us we're only going to go as deep as our own heartfelt sincerity and showing the things in life that we can't control or the things that are constantly changing that we always want to be one way or another. It's just breaking apart all of, uh, as imaginary as they may be, all imaginary uh, presuppositions or attachments, identifications, so that there's nothing but heartfelt sincerity that will, of course, lead us into the realization of who we are, what the world is, and, of course, recognizing the play of the one eternal awareness dressed up as all individuals simply exploring and experiencing its own vast potential throughout, you know, a world of infinite self-reflection and never-ending decorations, which is, of course, a great celebration of, of devotion. Awakening is so that you can realize that you're attending a party called devotion. And so the only way to really get to the party of devotion or to realize you're already the party of devotion is to inquire, but the inquire will only take you as deeply as your sincerity. And life, of course, has an amazing way, whether in a spiritual journey or in our everyday lives, of breaking apart anything that keeps us from the deepest relationship with our own heartfelt sincerity. So to me, it just seems that the spiritual journey is simply a journey into the never-ending depths of innocence and heartfelt sincerity. Let's, let's talk around sincerity a little bit and try to come to that a, on a different point or two so that we're not just saying okay. the same word so that people can kind of, if they're stuck on that word, that uh, maybe. Sure. Uh, and, and another word for that is openness. Is that primarily the reason why the phenomenon of interpretation with words and meaning has created such a limiting, confining feeling in the body as illusory as those meanings are, and yet they're just decorations of awareness, is that when we are living our lives solely lost in how we interpret and define things, the reason we feel so confined in our bodies or we feel as if we're separate from a happiness that we can't be separate from is because we're not experiencing life to the greatest level of openness. Uh, in a tremendous state of openness, with, which some people experience as being this blown open experience of realization in that openness. There's no need to divide ourselves from other aspects of ourselves with opinions and projections and interpretation. And instead that there's this flow of, of intimacy, as Rupert said, there's this intimacy where we are relating to what appears to be other people in the world as the oneself. And so when I speak of the word innocence, I'm speaking of the word openness, which is the willingness to embrace all forms through the recognition that all forms are just a decoration of the absolute, indescribable, ever-present reality that you are. So openness it, uh, uh, clearly is uh, like inversely proportional to knowing, right? Because if you know something, you're not open to that anymore. You're, you're, you've got that one categorized. So then openness well, and I, I sincerity actually, has no categories. I would actually say that 
the deepest knowing is proportionate to how open you are. And most may experience not being as open because they tend to be only as open as the knowing that they've collected along the way. So if we are, if there's a sense of valuing openness and seeing if there's anything in our experiencing that seems to discolor that openness and openness is valued completely and wholeheartedly, then the deepest knowing will find its way to you instead of us having to go running for a knowing that is just going to cloud how open, free, and liberated and happy we already are. So if we abide in openness, which is getting a feel of what it's like to be completely honest, What's it like to look at every breath as its own lifetime? What's it like to look at every interaction as a relationship with oneself? We really start to, um, again, there, there, is the tradition, there is a sense of inquiring into the relative forms to find the absolute. And yet there's also the opportunity to deeply, more intimately relate to the relative and the absolute wakes up within those appearances and forms as well so there's many ways you can approach this but as i've seen and what i've experienced um in, in in meeting with and working with people who are on this path wanting to have a deep experience and a deep realization <clears throat> they seem to have an ability to talk about this and talk about these teachings and the words and you know awareness and awareness is constant and, and all that kind of stuff but it doesn't necessarily match all the time the experience that that they recognize they're having and they're still in search of some sort of preferred state or spiritual achievement. And, and what I see is the innocence and heartfelt sincerity being overlooked. And yet when, I, when I've met with people who have never heard anything about this spiritual path, but have just had a heartfelt willingness and innocence to just explore like a child would explore a cave that it's never seen for the first time, then these kinds of realizations can, can come about in a very spontaneous and a very pure way. And when it happens in that way, it seems to not only allow this recognition to happen, but that there's no sense that this recognition and the living of life have to be separate or distinguishable in any way. A lot of times we, uh, we hear people talk about uh, things are less real or not real or, uh, you know, thought forms or interpretations. Or, but Rupert, you said one thing that was interesting that you, uh, instead of saying uh, not real, you said not real in the way we think. Yes, yes, e exactly. E you're right, those of us that... that went to India originally for spiritual teaching, often heard, or, or just to Indian teachings, often heard the phrase, the world is an illusion. And this phrase is very puzzling because our experience, we know that our experience is real. Like this experience we are having now, it is real. We're not quite sure what it is. For instance, we can't be absolutely certain that we're not dreaming. But even if we're dreaming, there is still a reality to this experience. It's a real dream. It's, it's a real whatever it is. We don't know what it is. In fact, we can't know what it is. But there is something, let's put it like this, there is something about the current experience that is real. It may not be real as a world or an object or a computer screen or a table or a desk or a wall. These labels which thought believes define the reality of experience. These labels may not define the reality of our experience. In, in fact, we know very well they don't. They're, they're convenient labels. They're necessary for practical purposes. But we know that if we explore our experience, it's not made up of a lot of objects. So for this reason, it said it's, the world is not real as we normally conceive of it. In this sense, the world is an illusion. It's an illusion as an outside 
independently existing object. But it doesn't mean that experience is not real. It's just that it's not real in the terms that thought conceives it. So now, what then is the reality of our experience? What, what is truly experienced? To, to, to give an analogy, we, we, we're looking at a, a screen now, and there, are, it, there, there seem to be three people there. But if we go and we touch the screen, we touch, try to touch these three people to find out what is truly there. We don't find three people. We find a screen. In other words, the reality of the appearance of these three people is the screen. The screen is what is real about the appearance. Now, that's just a metaphor, but, but look around. Whatever you're looking at, it, it's an appearance. A, a, a room, chairs, tables, flowers, all these appear. What is real about them? We think we perceive a world, but in fact, we don't perceive a world. We just know our perception of the world. Nobody has ever found a world independent of perception. We can't even say we have a perception of a world because that world has never been found. All we can say is that we know our perception, not even our perception of the world. We just know perception. But now, what is it that knows perception? What is the relationship between perception and whatever it is that knows it or experiences it? And if we go simply, intimately to the experience of perception, we don't find that it is divided in two parts. One part that does the knowing and another part that is known. One part that perceives and another part that is perceived. We just find perceiving, which is just a general name for seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. And if we go deeply into the experience of perceiving, we, we as it were, we reach in to the experience of perceiving and find what is its substance? What is the reality? What is it made of? All we find there is the knowing of it. All we find there is the awareness of it. All we find there is awareness. Now, what is it that finds awareness there? Whatever it is that finds awareness there must itself be aware. In other words, it is awareness that finds itself there. All experience, if we go deeply into it, is just awareness knowing itself. That is the reality of experience, what we call awareness, this, this aware, alive presence, which is what we refer to when we say I, our self. That is what we find when we go intimately to experience and touch the stuff out of which it is made. We don't find matter and we don't find mind. We just find this aware, alive presence. It finds itself. It knows itself. That is the reality of experience. You mentioned that we, when we really go into a per perception, we, we don't find what was perceived, and then we don't per find the perceiver. But in a, w yes. in a way, we're used to, uh, we're f we have a perception. Something comes on the screen, okay? And then we're aware of uh, pulling back to our mind and saying, oh, this is that, that's that, this is that color, there's a border there, this goes over there, this goes over there, this means this to me, this means nothing to me. And so then we get really wrapped up in that part. And then it seems like that preempts the possibility to go mm, the, the full distance that you're talking about and to realize that nothing really is there except awareness 
of what you're aware of, because even what you're aware of is somehow you you see that too. But you, in a way, our attention's blocked from that. We're not blocked, but just uh, diverted. It it's, it seems to be diverted in the same way that, relatively speaking, the screen that we're all looking at now seems to be obscured by the pictures of three people. And our fascination with the three people seems, seems to obscure the screen. See, when you but, say obscure right away, but, I don't like, you know, that word really pushes in one direction, you know. It's decorated. Matt would say it's decorated, right? <laughs> I like decorated. And you, you know what I would add to this, just to add, uh, just to spice, <laughs> add a little spice to the conversation, just because I, I think that if we have an opportunity to speak about this in a way that gives everyone who's watching as deep of an experience as possible, and Richard, I would, I would just just as a possibility. One of the things that makes it very interesting is when we start to look within, we see the things that aren't there in the way we independently talk about them, and we begin to have a dialogue about the things that, that remain without any concern, consideration about the things that aren't there. So if we look within and we don't see a mind or an ego, which I would just call a decoration, which, as Rupert said, is just another way in which awareness is experienced itself. If we look in and don't find an ego or a mind, then maybe we put that aside and we only talk about what we do find. If we look within and don't find anything that calls itself a barrier, then we put that aside and we actually look within and say, well, what is present in my experience? And what if we were to talk about only what we can find ourselves and only speak from the position of our direct experience so that we're speaking about what is in fact here to be recognized that is recognizing itself throughout this play of decoration with no concern or consideration of assuming what is when in fact when we look, we may not in fact find those things that we so often on the spiritual path talk about instead of the opportunities to sincerely talk about what remains that always is. So if we were to, if we were, like if I asked you, Richard, if we were to speak about only what you can look within and find for yourself, only speak about what is, which may not in fact be calling it anything we've ever referred to it as, because those are just those are just reference points. What arises to be spoken when we speak about what is here? Looking and noticing that the things we usually speak about aren't in fact here at all when we look directly for ourselves. Well, I mean, the first thing you could say is it would be uh, immensely simplified, right? <laughs> right. But that's, you know, that's, that's the point where the simplified realization or that understanding, now we're having a conversation where deep felt, as I said before, sincerity, openness, and innocence is actually in dialogue with itself, even though it seems to be decorated in the appearance of three different individuals. See, that to me is where I'm talking about the sincerity is when we begin to speak about what is here, which of course Rupert is touching upon in many beautiful ways. If we are constantly talking about trying to negotiate, reframe, or change our relationships with the things we haven't looked for directly, once we look for those things directly, we don't find those things there, or anything that calls itself what we call it, what then happens when we speak from the place of speaking about that which is always here, that which is constant, that which remains, decorating and celebrating itself through this momentary play? See, I wanted to say that kind of the same thing to Rupert, because uh, uh, when we were talking about what's real and what's, what's, what's arbitrary or optional, right? And now we're talking about what's here right now from in my own direct experience. We were talking about what's real. And the presumption when we talk about what's real is that there is something in our experience that is not real. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Where is that? Where do we find the not real? It's never experienced. 
Wow. So e even the even when we talk about reality, we talk about what's real in our experience. We are making a concession to the belief that there is something which is not real, and we've got to get past that or beyond that to the to the real reality behind it. Take the analogy of the screen again. It's like suggesting that there is something that we're looking at on our screen now that is not real, for instance, three people. And that the real reality of our experience is the screen behind the three people. But there aren't three, it, we're just talking of using the metaphor now of what we're looking at. There aren't three people there in the first place. There's just the screen. So it, it doesn't even make sense in the end to talk about reality because of the subtle presumption that there is something in our experience that is unreal, that has to be discarded or got past. So to talk about what's real as opposed to what is not real makes a concession to the separate self. It's, it's a point of view taken up by the separate self as it tries to explore, as it apparently tries to explore its experience. But if we take our stand as we are, and of course that doesn't make sense, there's no entity to take their stand there, but if we stand knowingly as we are, where we are, which means just as this simple aware presence, there is no unreality that ever comes into existence that needs to be fought with or transcended or avoided or got over. For, from, from the real and only point of view of ourself, our simple, natural, ordinary being. We, we never leave that. Nothing ever leaves that. Nothing ever truly comes into existence. Existence means to stand out from. Nothing ever truly stands out from ourself, just as the image on the screen never truly stands out from the screen. For, 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 from the point of view of ourself, which is the only real point of view, th that there are no, there is never a separate self. There is never an object or an experience that needs to be somehow overcome. In a way, you know, so, like the, our whole premise to start with was that everybody's searching for happiness. But and that, so then, but aren't they going to overcome their suffering or their uh, their uh, their urgencies, or are they going to transcend them? Or I mean, that seems to be the whole foundation of, uh, of actually this yes, whole movement. The, the reason we started with that is because that is where most of us feel we are. I, I'm unhappy, and I want to do something about it. I want to speak it. I want to search in in the conventional realms of objects or in the spiritual realm of, of states but so th this what we the way we started by saying everyone is in search of happiness it makes a concession to the separate self that thought believes us to be so and it's fine but we have to understand it's making a concession to a self that is not really there it's fine to start off searching for happiness that's what we all do we're nearly all motivated by suffering and to find happiness, but very soon, if we start exploring our experience, we, we find that there was never a separate self there in the first place, seeking for happiness. So then, this formulation of, of a separate self in search of happiness, in the end, we have to abandon it th through understanding, through seeing that there never was a separate self. Our unhappiness is only as real as the separate self that thought imagines us to be. All unhappiness is for that imaginary self. So in that way, it's not real, right? It, it, for, uh, only, for the, real. only for the imaginary self, but for the, for the real self, exactly. for the self. The, the separate self is, is only a real self from its own illusory point of view. In, in fact, the same goes for duality. Duality is only real from the illusory point of view of duality. But duality is truly non-existent. It's not a real point of view. 
if if there was something called duality, then we would have a real problem on our hands. We would have to do something about it. This is why understanding, it's understanding that counts, not intellectual, theoretical understanding, but experiential understanding, uh, uproots this whole idea of there being something called ignorance that we need to somehow get rid of or go beyond. I find it so empowering when, when I think of uh, individually that, you know, I can look into my suffering and I can look into my urgencies and I can look into my agendas and I can look into uh, how I treat other people. And I can see that so many things there are only real to the separate self and, and you know, it's very empowering. And, uh, and, and, and it's actually the source of true freedom or only freedom or, you know, I don't know, freedom is just another one of those things that uh, supposes there's bondage and uh, bondage is just something that's real to the separate self. And uh, I find that so empowering, but I find it in a way kind of dangerous uh, to, uh, what should I say, extrapolate that to others. And to say, okay, like uh, the last four or five years, I think the figures are 14 million uh, Americans lost their homes to foreclosure. So let's say 40, 45 million people are not living in their own home anymore. They're living with their parents or on the street or in a rented apartment or somehow their life degraded and they probably had a bankruptcy on their record and stuff like that. Uh, and to say that, you know, somehow that's their suffering, so then it must ergo, you know, that, that it's not real for them either. They could find out it too. And, and then there's nothing to do about that, really, because it really doesn't show up unless I'm thinking about it. But I mean, if I really go to what's real in this moment, it doesn't show up. And the basic injustices maybe, or the, you know, injustice just means like how our society is, uh, the, the institutions of our society are codified, uh, somehow allowed that to happen. And so then that could be fixed, right? I mean, uh, the, co the codification is the agreements of how we, how we live together. And uh, I, th I find that really dangerous to uh, somehow say that, you know, that's the, that they have the chance to be empowered by realizing that the, you know, their, their foreclosure wasn't real, uh, in a sense. But, but Richard, that, that, that that's not what is being suggested at all. Yeah, let's be real clear but, on it. No, in other words, what I'm asking. Y yes. Yes, th there's... Uh, I, I, nobody is suggesting for a minute that it's not le legitimate to to want to um, uh, earn a living and bring up your family and and for there to be justice and equity in society. All these things, true justice, true equity, are actually the outcomes, the inevitable outcomes of true understanding or love. So I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that that, that there isn't um Is it a danger? Are people uh, receiving it that way? Are they thinking, oh, no, well, it's so, no. it's so simple. I guess the whole world is simple. I could just, uh, uh, I could just well, uh, what is dangerous, understand Richard? the vast. What I is, see the vastness. What is dangerous? Tell me. If anything is dangerous at all, what is dangerous is to consider oneself to be a separate, limited entity. L look at all the the so-called ills of the world. They nearly all come from the result of feeling that we are separate, limited entities. That is what is dangerous. That is what causes conflict in relationships. To go to the heart of our experience and discover love and peace and intelligence there is not dangerous. And, and, and this discovery flows out naturally and, and infiltrates every aspect of our lives, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we perceive, the way we act, the way we relate. So it, th this is... This experiential understanding is 
in a way we could say it was the true salvation for humanity it, it it's it's available it always has been available and it doesn't preclude exploring one's experience in in this way doesn't preclude leading a natural ordinary simple life earning a living having a house having a family so it's not it would be very different it very difficult sorry very different if this understanding was somehow appropriated by the separate self and was used as a means of the se separate self perpetuating itself and, and that of course happens sometimes it happens a lot actually i mean i was just noticing in myself uh, a few months ago that i was actually believing in personal karma just to say that i had no pain in my life and really the whole uh, uh the whole world has got pain here and there and i was just cutting it all out saying hey look my walls of karma are here <laughs> i'm a separate guy but i decorated it with a spiritual concept and you know just just to jump in and and just to add to what rupert was saying about talking about the danger and you're talking about society and one of the things that i noticed and i think it, it just kind of perhaps adds just a, a, another dimension to this is that if we look at the human journey whether you want to you know impose a spiritual journey or call a spiritual journey a part of that to me there is the human journey the spiritual journey is just uh included in that that the lowest most desperate experience we may ever face is called isolation isolation is the absence of acknowledgement the highest form of experience we can feel we can call oneness unity or love which is the full absorption or immersion into acknowledgement when someone is perhaps committing a crime or criminal behavior they feel so under acknowledged from their life whether from their upbringing or feel so under acknowledged in their own relationship with themselves that they project and impose onto those that they want to and force to acknowledge them because of what hasn't been acknowledged themselves and yet perhaps one of the highest forms of conscious experiences is the realization that the reality that i am is what's being acknowledged and all I perceive or see no matter what my experience of it happens to be. And so what it, it seems to be is that throughout our entire human journey, the entire human journey is basically a journey throughout all facets and spectrums of acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement, of course, is synonymous with awareness and that in awareness, there's nothing but acknowledgement occurring. And when there's nothing but acknowledgement occurring, you can say there's nothing being denied so it is a silent inherent yes being offered the yes to acknowledge whatever appears as a decoration of the awareness that sees it which of course speaks to the all inclusiveness and intimacy that this dialogue is is speaking about and so it seems to be that what the spiritual journey the hope for the spiritual journey really is and i can speak from the experiences of meeting a lot of people who can say all of this who have had glimpses of it and yet their life exists in whatever form it does based on how much or how little is being equally acknowledged and that when we have a willingness to explore our lives one moment at a time as an eternal yes to acknowledging whatever gets our attention as a sound whether it's a dog barking a child crying or the sound of what we call a thought or the appearance of a lover or a family member no matter what their experience of us happens to be when the willingness and the heartfelt sincerity is celebrated through simply acknowledging everything as being equal to the sum of the whole noticing everything as a decoration of the sum of the whole where there's just awareness acknowledging whatever's appearing that acknowledgement of equality that we can offer each momentary experience to me is what cultivates the sincerity that allows the experiences that we've talked about and that Rupert has touched upon for someone to directly have versus just listen to 
or be able to memorize and talk about. So to me, when I look at life, the world, even though I know it's a magnified reflection of that which I am, if I look at things on a societal level, if I look at things of someone who I'm working with or just people in lives having whatever experience they're having, I look at how deeply is life being acknowledged. And of course, we can say that the discovery of nothing but awareness can only come about when those acknowledgments of what is here goes to a much deeper level. And so what if we were to look at life is only here to be acknowledged and that the celebration of what we realize in the spiritual path anyway is just a celebration of that which it acknowledges, acknowledging itself throughout the diversity of form. That is really life is a celebration of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is kind of like has a prerequisite, I think, and it's called presence or you got to be here, right, in order to acknowledge I disagree. God. No? No, it's acknowledge means see. So tell me what you have to, what button do you have to push in your head to see right now? What do you have to do in order to see or are you well, already seeing before you realize I drive that down, you're seeing? I drive down the street and I see a thousand things, but I only acknowledge ten. But only tell me about what's true about you seeing right now. Right now you're seeing, and the seeing didn't cause you to do anything as a prerequisite. So then the seeing and the acknowledgement is just two different words of pointing to that, which is always aware. Aware celebrates its, its own inherent potential through acknowledgement. The idea that we have to do something first is just perhaps in the way of seeing that you're already acknowledging and seeing even before you're there to speak about how you acknowledge and see. So, so put aside how you acknowledge and put aside what you see and just let's acknowledge that you see and that seeing that you're acknowledging is always here. Can you at least see that? I can. I can see that. I Wonderful. Mean, I, I was thinking I was seeing the screen, but really I was supposed to be seeing Matt, you know, and, and uh, following what he was saying. And uh, I was also thinking I see the cameras and uh, the recording and thinking it's really cool. So that's kind of like off. <laughs> and so that, that points to a very good point. See, the focus was on what you were seeing versus that you were seeing. So put, put aside what you're supposed to see or what you should be seeing. Put aside what you think you should or shouldn't see, and let's just see that seeing is always here. So if we put aside what we see and just explore that we see, perhaps the seeing of that is more immediate. So defocus on content. No, not, no, no, just the seeing of whatever you call content. Just see. See that you are always seeing no matter what is here to be seen. So put aside the word content or not. It doesn't matter. If you see content, it's because you're calling it content. And that's okay if you are, because as Rupert talked about earlier, th that in itself is just awareness. And that's what I would call it in, in my language. I call it decoration. So content is just a decoration of what sees. What I'm saying is if you put aside all prerequisites of what you impose onto what you should or shouldn't see, which is why a lot of people always are lost in this idea of trying to be in the present moment versus exploring themselves as the present moment, put aside what you see and just see that regardless of what you say about what you see or what you call what you see, just see that you are always seeing. And what does it feel like in your experience when you see that you are the one who sees it all? That's the intimacy of this invitation being offered. Who in your life, Richard, sees but you? Don't you see what you see? Who's the cons? Aren't you the one who's had 100% perfect attendance in your life? Hasn't everything been seen by you? I've been in every one of my videos, you know. <laughs> Nobody else could say that. 
<laughs> right. So we know that you <clears throat> are the constant. And in that constant, the only constant, uninterrupted reality is seeing. So the constant is you. The constant is seeing. So perhaps you are nothing more than seeing itself, seeing itself in whatever form any decoration of possibility momentarily appears. You are seeing itself, seeing itself. Seeing, seeing, seeing. Wonderfully put. <laughs> experiencing, 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 experiencing. experiencing. Knowing, I love it. Knowing, knowing. Awareness, aware of itself. Yes. Which is w another name for love. Love. Somewhere, exactly. somewhere in there, action comes in too, right? There is some movement, right? Spontaneously, it will happen. If you know, because here's the thing it, it seems to be that when you assume that action needs to come into it, we are assuming that there's something to interrupt this reality, which leads us to this idea of like, I get into this perfect meditative state that I've got to come out and play my roles. And we're kind of projecting onto the absolute reality, this kind of fragmented existence that really, if we just see into the seeing itself, we see that the activity of doing is arising as an expression or a decoration of being, and that it is the being that is supposedly, if you want to call it doing, any of these activities. So when we start to really make direct contact, I can say, with this sense of seeing in ourself, then we wind up doing exactly what we've always been meant to do at the exact moment we've always been meant to do it. The only difference is, I mean, in your life, you've always been doing exactly what you're meant to do at the moment you're meant to do it. It's just there are these ideas that assume that I may not always be doing things at the right moment, so we just live in this sense of doubt, which makes us think that there's some sort of imagined sense of control, that I have to be the one in control of it. And then, of course, on the spiritual path, we think that, oh, this sense of doing is in the way of being, and we make up all these imaginary battles instead of seeing that making a mistake is one of life's greatest fantasies, and that everything is happening in the way that it's happening, in the way that you could ride a roller coaster and have an anxiety attack because you think you're steering it, and then eventually just put your arms in the air and you let the roller coaster drive itself because you see that out of this sense of eternal being, out of this seeing that is only seeing itself, all forms of doing, which are just more decorations, equal decorations to thought or to forms, all of that spontaneously arises on its own. You're just experiencing what it's like to be the one that may think or not think it's doing, but that's just another experience that has a beginning, contains an end, and is a temporary decoration appearing within the vastness of this constant seeing that when you look directly, you'll find is the only truth to what you are because it's what's always here it seems to me that you. the that the uh it's not that hard of a mechanism to see that why uh doing looks off you know because we don't notice everything and as we Which would be, as right. we start to notice more stuff we say oh my god i'm doing this and look what i'm creating over there i wasn't noticing that i was creating this by doing this and my doing is wrong now i got to change it and so then and so, you know and, you could call it, you could say that that is uh is just uh, somehow uh, sourced, uh, rising by itself, doing, but it also just appears to have like a, an increasing noticing. As noticing uh, deepens or, or moves to in one direction or another, we uncover things that uh, don't seem to be the, uh, the way we want it to be. You know, maybe it's unjust or maybe well, and, we're and, and taking advantage just, what, of people or something like that. Well, what you just said was the deeper noticing, which would be going deeper into the journey of acknowledgement. And of course, as we continue to go deeper into acknowledgement, we're not necessarily, hopefully the, the, the interest isn't uncovering more things that we think we're doing wrong or right, but actually just in noticing the activity and movements. Well, that's just a that side are, effect. It's just a side effect uh, that we do see that we're doing things wrong and right. It's, un it's unavoidable, isn't it? 
as we notice, well, as the noticing broadens? Pardon? Well, what I, what I would say is if we, as an experiment, if in this moment we were speaking about only what we're seeing right now, for example, you're seeing these three, you're seeing three individuals here having this dialogue. As you and I are speaking right now, you see that you're the one who's here. You have already acknowledged you've had a perfect attendance record in your life. And in that you that is constant, there's nothing but constant seeing, right? As Rupert so eloquently put, seeing, seeing, seeing. So if we were just to see each other, tell me if just in seeing alone, anything that you just suggested is actually occurring, or is there just seeing no matter what appears to be seen? Tell me what tell me what is true when we see right now. I guess I don't really trust that. Okay, good. So now let's let's take it even deeper. And so my question and the question is let's inquire into why don't you trust it? I mean, I can give you a reason. And, uh, and that, that, that's okay that you give me a reason because the reason will take us deeper. I, uh, well, the reason is because I live in a gated community, you know, and I hold out so much of the world that I don't want to be involved with. And, uh, but do you live in a gated community right now as you just look in this direction? What's true right now? Only right now. Just so we can have something. You no, know, right now I'm in a gated basement <laughs> with the doors okay. locked, right? <laughs> now, does that gated basement call itself a gated basement? No, but nobody else can get in, though. <laughs> right. So let's so, so just for the sake of inquiry, let's put those words aside, and let's just talk about what there is or isn't a trust about the fact that you see that you're seeing whatever you see. Like when you look at this direction, you're looking perhaps at a face talking to you, and if you just see the face that's talking to you, the seeing doesn't have to call it or not call it anything. It doesn't have to trust or distrust anything because in that seeing, even if there was trust or distrust, those would just be arising to be seen. So perhaps there's the judgment about distrust that causes you to play out a sense of not being able to trust and then we pursue it. But if you can just see that in just seeing who's speaking to you, my question is what is there to trust or distrust about seeing what you see right now. There's a belief in me that what I see right now is highly managed by me. Uh, okay. By years and years, I've managed it, uh, and then this is the result of, uh, of uh, my belief in my separate self and my castle that I built around my separate self. And, and right. that, uh, and uh, right. whatever, uh, well, just the example I gave, the 14 million homes that are are uh, foreclosed on. They're not down here, and they're and I, you know, I don't really sure. want them. I don't really want them. And so then those guy, those people uh, that may be <laughs> wondering how to spend their Christmas, uh, uh, I don't care about them. You know, I just as soon keep them out right. and and say that they're, you know, that's their problem. You know, off with okay, well, And and so just to take this a little deeper, you you said a second ago that this is from a belief. So if you were to close your eyes and look within yourself if you were to see into <clears throat> this manifestation of seeing called Richard, would we find, would we see anything calling itself belief? Would we find a sign that says, take a left turn towards the belief next to the casino? Would we see anyone who is holding on to a belief or the result of belief or, or is there just seeing? When you just look within, tell me what you see. Well, there's just seeing. Because okay. if I strip away all thoughts, of course, uh, none of that exists, right? And but do you it's have also, to strip it away? Well, I mean, really they just fall off. Away? They fall off, you know. They fall now, off when, really I don't, do? uh, when I don't generate them. And, uh, and so did you, know, you strip that away or did you just see? I just saw that it wasn't here and if I wasn't generating it, you know. But somehow okay. I believe that I live in a manifest world that has other people in it, you know. And I could okay. say, call it a unity, and uh, but they're not all under my roof, and some of them are under. I'm just going on this one example, right? They're right, not under my and roof, and so they're not under their roof anymore either. So if you were to look within and see that there's only seeing, what does that seeing have to say? 
right now. Well, that's an expansive feeling that wants to uh, and, uh, and wants to include. Okay. Okay. So then, if it wants to include, then let's include. How would you like? to act on that sense of including in the way you feel that seeing wishes to include. How would I, did you ask me how I would like to act? How would you like to, it says, you said the sense is that it wants to include. Right. So, okay, now let's include. How would you like to go about that? How would you like, because a second ago we were talking about a whole lot of different things. Now we've got to a place of include because I said, what does that seeing have to say? And it says there's a sense of it wants to include. So, okay, let it include. What would that look like? Let's seeing include <clears throat> right here, right now. Now what? I can find completeness, but some, some, somehow in that incompleteness, I think there's something huge missing. Now, does the seeing see anything missing? Look, look into the seeing. See what seeing sees. Only tell me what seeing sees, because you look within and found nothing but seeing, so tell me what seeing sees. Does seeing see anything missing, or is just missing? A decoration arising and seeing. It's a decoration that I want to also include the decoration. Good, and I will, and I, and I'm sure we would agree. I welcome you to welcome and include that decoration. So now let's include that decoration in the seeing, not to agree or disagree with it, but let's just see how complete it already is to just see what nothing but seeing happens to see right now. Can you see how complete you already are? Can you see how complete everything is because it's all a decoration appearing within the completeness of seeing itself? You are that. All you have to do is see it. I would even say you already are seeing it because you're seeing. Just see that you see. And then from the reality or realization that you see, what you see is just a parade of diversity. Just infinite decorations of potential, equal to the sum of the whole. See that you see so that you can embrace and include whatever you see. Let me ask Rupert. <laughs> I'll take this up with an expert. <laughs> I mean, Rupert, is that enough? I'm saying it's not enough. Something's missing, you know. I can feel really good for years, actually. Well, what do you feel is missing, Richard? <laughs> you know, well, one thing is like, uh, okay, I'll just tell a little story. Let me, let me ask you another question. Put, put it in, in, in another way. For awareness, is something missing? Is, is awareness saying there is something missing? I, I need something in this moment. You know, there's two things you could say. One is awareness has no dissatisfaction. You could say that. No, but, but, but don't, don't give me a, the correct advice to answer. Go, go to your experience now, to, to, to the one that is knowing your thoughts and your feelings and your perceptions and ask that one in the intimacy of your experience, ask that one if anything is missing.
when I say nothing's missing, and when I say I acknowledge, acknowledging and acknowledge what shows up, I acknowledge that I'm a complex matrix. But what was the answer to the question, Richard, when you asked yourself if something was missing? What was the answer? I'm answering, I'm answering that nothing's missing, number one. And number two, I'm answering that what shows up is a complex matrix that has uh, uh, a desire to move in a certain direction. And uh, I don't call that missing. I just call that something okay. that okay. I can honor and I can move in that direction. And, and that's where uh, this unit is right now. But would it, would it, be, would it be possible, for instance, for, uh, as you quite rightly say, there's, there's this matrix of thoughts and feelings and sensations that there's a, a kind of a body mind entity called called richard that is motivated to move and act and relate and do but when you refer to your deepest experience you find that there is nothing essentially missing there so would it be possible for this matrix of thoughts and feelings and sensations called richard to, to move from the experiential understanding that nothing is missing to move to act to relate to think to feel from informed by this deep sense that nothing is truly missing that doesn't mean to say no thought no action no feelings no relationships nobody is saying that but just to allow your thoughts and your feelings your activities, your perceptions, your relationships to proceed from this experiential understanding rather than proceeding from the belief and the feeling that something is missing. See, you know, I've just had this a uh, a flash actually just now that when when I say nothing is missing, I don't mean no thing is missing or there's just space and, 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 and warm feeling there. I just mean that why would this matrix of events called Richard want to escape this matrix of events, uh, events and perceptions and thoughts and feelings? Why would I want to uh, move away from it and say, well, there may be some place where I can find this great opening and warmth and uh, in uh, why, a place I'm not do doing or, not, or, or nothing happening. So then I feel like the real, uh, when nothing is really missing, then everything that's here is totally okay. Uh, all the anxieties, all the nervousness, all the push, all the wanting that's to save the world, all the wanting to uh, put things on the table and express arguments and, ex and, and speak uh, uh, topics and uh, all the ideas that there's confusion and there should be less confusion, all those things, I accept all those there's no reason that I feel like, you know, my freedom is that I don't need to move away from that in any sense. I don't know. Does that, does that make any clarity? Or, I mean, I, I'm not looking for another place that's going to be uh, uh, open and spacious and, uh, and, uh, and where happiness or unhappiness doesn't even matter. You know, I'm not looking for a vast place uh, of, as a refuge. Uh, I'm not motivated because... I want to throw away this matrix of events called Richard and I want to get away from it. I'm, I'm actually motivated because I want to express it and let it go however it goes, sure. Uh, you know, it maybe will go to a more clarity and it will shuck a lot of, uh, of things that seem to be uh, concerns. And uh, it will mm, have more energy actually is what I'm noticing and it will uh, express itself more with more liberty and more freedom uh, and it will uh, contact more, more seemingly separate individuals and say, hey, how are you? Happy day. What are you doing today? <laughs> yes, nobody's suggesting, Richard, that, that this understanding, this experiential understanding results in an absence of thoughts and activities and relationships and perceptions. It's, uh, on the contrary, it's just that thoughts and feelings and activities and relationships are freed from the tyranny of feeling that we are a limited separate self actually thoughts and feelings and activities that they flourish as a result of being liberated from the separate self it's not that they and and and, and if the little if this little package of this matrix called Richard has an inclination to 
to interview people and to talk about these things, then, you know, chances are that that's going to keep happening. Uh, for, for another person, they may be motivated to travel across the world to, to help in, in, a, in a conflict zone. That, that's not necessarily going to cease. It's, that activity is just going to be informed by the love and the understanding that is inherent in ourself. It's no longer going to be informed by the conflicts and neuroses and anxieties of an imaginary self. So there's no suggestion here that thinking, feeling, acting, perceiving and, and relating is, is going to come to an end. Yeah. On the contrary, it's going to flourish. Uh, that's what I think I'm noticing, it's, right? It, it's I, I going think to I serve. see the evidence of that. Yes, beautiful. But, In, but, but Richard, I, I, you're already doing it. You're, you're, you're doing these interviews is already an expression of your love and understanding, your deep interest in the truth, your, your desire to connect and communicate and broadcast. It, this already comes, for, it doesn't come from, from, the, from the sense of separation or limitation or lack or fear. It, it's already an expression of love and intelligence in you. It's, it's beautiful, you're, you're doing it already. And if I could <clears throat> just add what I'm feeling, which of course it is true, you're already doing it. But what I feel in you, Richard, and this is just what I'm feeling intuitively, again, in the totality, there's nothing but inclusion. And what I feel like is that, and I see this a lot, is that we act out sometimes in the most interesting ways just because there's, we have not included ourselves in the acknowledgement and inclusion of all that is here to be equally acknowledged. So now that you've had that flash that you just spoke about, what if, the, what if we take the next step and allow Richard which of course is inseparable from awareness, just a decoration of that experience, and allow that which simply sees as the decoration of Richard to acknowledge Richard as being equal to the sum of the whole, as you are, and to allow you, the one who maybe acknowledges the truth in others, acknowledges what you offer to all, but is Richard being included? Is Richard being loved and acknowledged equally? And what if this moment is an opportunity to acknowledge this appearance of Richard is the whole, is the totality, and to celebrate that acknowledgement with love that you can offer to this form because you, in fact, are the love you're looking for. So what happens when you recognize maybe all these things that arise that you've been speaking about that you feel like are in the way of your experience are just because you have not been acknowledged equally. We find that when we are not acknowledging ourselves or when everything is not, not acknowledged equally, we perceive things through comparison. Perhaps when you are acknowledged right now as being equal to the sum of the whole, worthy of being loved as you are, and that you loving yourself is a celebration of this awareness, living in undying devotion to the vastness of itself. Perhaps all these comparisons and perceptions can be viewed as decorations and as a part of the celebration and not obscuring the acknowledgement that only you can offer yourself right now because you deserve it. You deserve to be loved, Richard. When does Richard begin to acknowledge and include Richard? You know, there's kind of like a danger to what you say. I mean, uh, not, not what you say, but uh, I can, can notice it in myself because a Good. lot of times I say that uh, I don't really appear here too much, you know, like right. I don't really feel like when people acknowledge me that uh, I did anything. And uh, I understand. And, uh, 
I, if they say what I do is good, of course, if they say what is bad, or I, it's too confused, uh, that doesn't really hit me either too much. But somehow there's a certain amount of transparency here, transparency to my own experience. So then that could very well mean that I am somehow offing my own experience of myself, cutting it off. Yes. And, uh, and somehow it's not totally, you know, I'm thinking it's a holy, I have this belief that it's more holy to be transparent, you know, and that that well, would be what, an right. end result that I would somehow, if I would fit the form of that end result of a total hollow bamboo, right? Where, the, where well, God right. flows through me, these kind of metaphors, right? Well, 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 it's easy. It's easy to say, it's easy to speak about the many facets of the no self when there is a belief or an experience of your life of you being irrelevant. And what I'm saying is, what if in this moment, even if it was just an I love you to your own heart, what if you were just in that way, it was the, the absolute self, which is awareness, acknowledging this form as being just a beautiful way in which the absolute decorates itself. I love you, which... Semantic-wise, some people go, well, who's the I and who's the you? Those are just sounds of words. Is just the vastness of awareness embracing the to to totality of itself within one or all forms. Right now, there is one form calling itself Richard that has not been acknowledged equal to the other things in your life that have been acknowledged. If Richard has not been acknowledged equally, there's probably other things in your life that are equally not being acknowledged by Richard. So what if the rate at which you begin to acknowledge Richard equally, lovingly, and openly, not only deepens this perspective for you to see what's being pointed to, but becomes a celebration to which all things in your life are equally celebrated and embraced as reflections and expressions or decorations, as I say, of the absolute reality that you are. That what if all this comes down to, that of course none, there isn't, there aren't any non-duality problems in the world. But what if right now you can see that Richard hasn't been acknowledged equally and loved, and it's not about taking credit, it's not about trying to be transparent. Transparency is just the vastness of being, and somehow in this magical miracle of life transparency reflects and appears as solid forms of wondrous beauty. And if, and if this manifestation of Richard has been decorated so beautifully, why not acknowledge it lovingly? Because you deserve to be loved. When do you begin loving you? Because we can talk about all this spiritual stuff, which is wonderful, and I've loved everything we've said so far, but I can feel in my heart how much of your heart has not been acknowledged by you. It is so easy on this spiritual path to talk about there is no one here. And there is, of course, as we've all been talking about, a certain level of inquiry. We look into the absolute truth of what is the absolute reality decorating itself through all these fleeting, temporary, impermanent forms. But the impulse of that absolute reality is to include, embrace, and acknowledge all parts equally. And now we see one named Richard that has not included itself in the totality of love. Let me just uh, put my couple of two cents in here, you know, because like in one sense, you know, I haven't really thought of those ideas before too much. Right. So then in one sense, uh, I can see that. In another sense, you know, I wash myself lovingly. I prepare, prepare food for myself lovingly. I, uh, I, I sleep pretty good and better than I used to. I, uh, you know, I relax in the, in the hot tub uh, uh, lovingly. I, uh, I spend time in the garden. And, and so, so many things I do are acknowledging myself and, and accepting myself. And again, I just come back to that thing, that matrix of me uh, with the missing parts and the, and, the, and, the, and the parts that are present, you know, whatever, whatever however you want to divide it and look at it and call it a matrix of uh, thoughts perceptions, feelings, and so on. Somehow I have no, no, I have no feeling that I got to get away from that or kind of move it more than it wants to move by that. It's going already, you know? And uh, so if, if, if you don't have to be away from it, what I'm saying is not necessarily that you don't do loving things for yourself. I'm saying what I feel could benefit you 
is to be with yourself more lovingly, not the things you do for yourself or the things that you do that bring you joy. But, but if you've acknowledged that you're not trying to get away from everything, then now let's be lovingly, openly with that which you're fully able to be with. Could you afford to be with yourself more lovingly, not the things you do or the activities that you do that you feel are representations of love, but can you be as you are lovingly, openly acknowledging whatever arises equal to that which you wholeheartedly prefer and allow that infinite acknowledgement of inclusion to allow all forms of a distinction to dissipate in an endless celebration of radiant devotion and heartfelt innocence. I would love for you to experience this and not be misunderstood that being lovingly with yourself and all has to do with doing anything for yourself. Your heart, which your heart beats in the bodies of all, because you're the only one that's here, which we can all say from our perspectives, deserves to be loved and acknowledged. Treat your heart like you would an infant. And you'll begin to see the world as a bunch of beautiful children just playing in an endless sandbox of miraculous grace and infinite potential. Love your heart and you'll live in a world where you will allow the children to play and you will play along as well. Well, I totally thank you for that, and I, uh, You're I, I, I connect to it. I connect to it. Good, wonderful. And even if we, even if in this moment I said to you, Richard, I love you, so that you can begin to absorb and acknowledge that you deserve to be loved, and it's okay to love you, and not think that that is in any way breaking any spiritual principle that in fact it is celebrating the absolute pull and gravitational pull of what is realized in this whole journey. And so even if I were to say the words that were to be the foreshadowing of what you might offer yourself more often, I would say to you, seeing you as I am, one and the same, I love you. Just as you are. You can't disappoint me. You can't impress me. I'm already fully, wholeheartedly in love with all that you are, with all that is, so absolutely touched in the way that this reality that I am appears as you do. Matt, you really go right for the nut. <laughs> yeah. Because I feel, I feel what the heart aches for. And so <laughs> this guy's really direct. <laughs> As I've said before, rarely do we find anyone deficient in spiritual understanding, but a heart simply in need of love. Everything we've talked about, the realizations, are absolutely spectacular and essential in seeing the deepest clarity, and it's wonderful because it is what celebrates the exploration of life itself. It is the seeing, it is, it is the clarity that, cel that, that substantiates a celebration of love, inclusion, openness, and innocence. But to think that the seeking of this clarity is in any way a replacement of a love that celebrates the entire purpose of being as we appear, as simply appearing as the character so that the love of all, the awareness of life, can embrace itself no matter what characters are brought together or pulled apart. Love is the celebration of this clarity, but the seeking of the clarity can't be a substitute for the love that we can offer ourselves and everything, which of course is what we are, equally one moment at a time, simply through the willingness to acknowledge.
Yeah, so I, I acknowledge I told, you. Yeah, thank you. I totally acknowledge what you're saying because, like, uh, and when I said I wanted to be inclusive, and I was just thinking I want to include those guys out there, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. 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 I mean, you, you'll find yourself including all those people out there at the rate at which Richard is loved, and and you might actually find an interesting little correlation there that the reason why you find things in the world that you're trying to push away is perhaps in you there is parts that have not felt equally included. And so the sense of wanting to push other things away, because there's a sense of if I let those things in, it might take more from me. And I'm afraid of losing what I have because of how deficient I am in the love that I really crave. So if you offer yourself that love and that equal acknowledgement, it will then be offering to yourself the totality what you'll celebrate by offering to other reflections throughout the totality. So if there's something in this world you cannot seem to love and embrace, love the you who can't. Because this whole lifetime is an endless spectrum of acknowledgement. It is an endless journey of love loving itself, of awareness meeting itself in a celebration of innocence and inclusion. And it's odd how loving the relative expressions and decorations can bring about not only a glimpse of what is eternal, but to show us that the relative decorations is just the loving and miraculous way in which the eternal celebrates itself in a never-ending dance of endless change where there's only acknowledgement here to be noticed. I think I'll call Rupert in and, and, and get a second opinion, but somehow this is so fundamental that uh, somehow it's pretty easy to skip over, I think. That the, bas the basic inclusion is just... I don't think you need a second opinion, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I think words have done their, have done their job. <laughs> I love you, Rupert. I love you, Richard. I love you, world. I love you, one. I love you all. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you both for a beautiful conversation. Thank you very oh, much, Rupert. Pleasure. It's been very, very sweet being with you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Rupert. Thank you, Matt. You're very welcome. I love you. I love you. See, Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for showing up and listening to this. I love you, too. <laughs> So, what a great way to perceive. <laughs>